first thing is hello. I'm Chris Reed. I'm not really here. I'm on sabbatical. And uh, I gather some of you are missing me, or even though you've not met me before. So yeah. one of the reasons for coming to do this seminar was to get a chance to meet some of you guys and talk to you, because yeah, it's nice doing research, but locked up in a room all day thinking, yeah, there is a point at which you think I like to talk to people. So this is that day as far as I'm concerned. And then the other reason I thought I'd like to do this is because doing research is quite difficult. Uh, those of you who are doing the LLM, some of you will be doing the dissertations. Working out what the story is you're trying to tell is really hard. And I've discovered that if I try and explain it to other people, that helps me to understand the story. So what I'm going to try and do is to explain to you the story of my research so far and where I think it's getting to. Right. Do not expect any definitive solutions. I've been working on this for two months now. Right? And when you see what the problem is, you'll realize, OK, it, it's a big problem. He's not going to finish it in two months. So I'll be coming back again, probably mid-January, something like that, maybe again late February, maybe in March, to have a, another go at explaining other aspects of it. And so we'll advertise the seminars. And yeah, those of you who weren't put off by today are able to come to those as well. Yeah. You're allowed. Yes. No, anybody's allowed to be here. Um, and actually today. Yeah. Oh, the recording. Thank you. I've done it. It's all right. Yes. My conscience was going to remind me to record the, the session. So I'm also recording this. I've got a, a notional Zoom thing coming Then Nobody is there on Zoom, but I'm going to use that to record this and then we can put the recording up. So people who couldn't come can look at it. And if you in the unlikely chance you want to look at it again, you'll have a link to it and you can look at it as well. So what I'm talking about today, well, this is my project, Open Text Should Regulatory Obligations for AI, and it's some first thoughts on fairness. And I wasn't expecting to sell the room out. You know, I thought, okay, I, I'll get two or three colleagues, a couple of PhD students, half a dozen LLM students, nice little kind group, you know, we'll, I'll chat a bit, we'll have questions, and here I have a, a lecture room, you know, normal capacity. Uh, and it made me think I can use it to show you how complicated fairness is, because if I'd known that more than 80 people would register because the room only takes 80, we'd have had to work out a fair system for allocating places in the room. Now, currently, we've done it first come, first serve, which is one kind of fairness. But if we were expecting more people, I might have said, well, can I have academic colleagues and PhD students first and then everybody else second? And that would have been a different kind of fairness. Right. Or I might have said, actually, my academic colleagues don't understand AI, but students and PhD students and LLM students do. So put the academics right at the bottom of the list. That would be another kind of fairness. As we'll see when we go through, fairness is really quite complicated. Right. What I'd like from you, please, at the end, is just any thoughts you have on this, because I'm still working out my ideas. And it's not as if none of you know about fairness. Right? Every one of you has been a child. Every one of you has cried out at some point, it's not fair. Yes? Right? So we all know about what fairness is. We all have an understanding of fairness. My difficult question is, how do I deal with this in the context of AI? So let me try and explain to you what I'm doing in my project. Right. I'm starting with an assumption that when we come to making the laws that regulate AI, which we're just starting to do, then what we're going to want to achieve is AIs which make decisions which are at least as good as human decision makers. Why would we get rid of a human decision maker and put an AI in place if the AI was worse? Now, you might, I mean, you can see why you might have it a little bit worse. Suppose a human decision maker can make one decision in a day and the AI can make 10,000, and there's a backlog of a million decisions to be made. We might say, okay, we'll, we'll take lower quality decisions just to get them all done. But most of the time, for anything important, we're going to want high quality decisions. And what are the kind of things I'm thinking of here? Because AI is pretty complex. Um, I've just responded to a consultation from the House of Common Science and Technology Committee, one of whose questions were, how good is current AI regulation? Is it, do, do we need, what do we need? How should, no, 
It was actually worse. It was, how should we regulate AI? And, and my response begins by saying, that's too, too big a question because AI is going to permeate every aspect of human life. It's going all the way from recommending the music you might like to listen to, to, and here's a really cool project I'm working on at the moment with some computer scientists and engineers, AI that controls a robotic surgeon. So there's no human surgeon. The robot cuts you open, removes whatever it's removing, sews you back up again, does it better than a human surgeon. That's the idea. Now, the whole of that, right, all the way from, hey, this is a real cool song you might like to listen to, to, hello, we've just removed your cancer. Yeah, saying, how should that be regulated? It's different, isn't it? Do you want to regulate the surgeon in the same way you regulate the music? Of course not, no. So it's enormous area. So I'm looking at the kind of decisions we might think are socially important. What kind of things are AI being used for at the moment? They're being used to decide if you should get probation, if you are convicted of a criminal offence. That's pretty important. Should you go to prison or should you be outside with someone monitoring you? That feels kind of yeah, important. Okay. Are you a good candidate for surgery? I'm getting older. This is of more concern to me. Age is a serious factor. People look at you and me and they go, only one of you can have the transplant. Right. You have all got, well, leaving you aside, everyone else, right? Yeah. We, we two are at the age where, where people go, yeah, you know, a number of useful years of life left, obviously not enormous compared to the youngsters here. We think we'll give them the kidney. Right. So, <laughs> well, I'd, if you, I'd be very impressed if you are in that case. No, nowhere near me. <laughs> okay, so that that kind of thing. Um, decisions about should you get a loan. No, decisions about should you get life insurance. Decisions. Yeah, there's a range of really important decisions that we currently leave to humans to make that we're going to want AIs to make. And um, my feeling is if, if we're going to want them to be as good as humans, then we're going to want them to meet the current human standards. Now, when you ask how good does the decision have to be, right, we then get in, we use in law open textured terms like fairness and reasonableness. Okay? You've all come across them. You know, you've all found them in the law. Fairness, yeah. So-and-so must act fairly, so-and-so must act reasonably, they must take reasonable care, they must do things reasonably quickly. We're going to want to have AIs which achieve fairness and reasonableness and things like that. That's the assumption. Sorry, excuse my ignorance. What do you mean by open text? Is something that a word which where the meaning could be expressed? Yeah, some, something where, where the, the an open textured obligation is one where there isn't one clear way of complying with it. So an example, I've just renewed my car insurance. Now, it's a legal obligation that I mustn't drive unless I have valid car insurance. That's a simple question of fact. Do I have valid car insurance? Yes, no. There's, the only way I can comply with it is by having valid car insurance. Now, the other obligation I have is to drive reasonably carefully. What does that mean? Well, that, that, that has a complex open meaning, right? It could mean different things in different circumstances. Yeah. This morning, I drove to the station, bright daylight, sunshine, but hardly any traffic. Tonight, I'll be driving home in the dark with rain. Is it different standard of care required in those circumstances? No, no, and, and a very reasonable question because not everybody, all the lawyers in this room will have come across the concept of open text obligations either. And if you want one current example, think about content regulation online, content moderation, right? Hate speech, harmful speech, terrorist speech, uh, yeah. sex discrimination promotion, all the things that we think we might as a society like to control. Right? We're going to want an AI doing that to do that fairly, aren't we? You're going to be upset if you put up a posting on Instagram and it gets taken down straight away and they say, it was hate speech. And you go, it was my cat. What, what's hate speech about my cat? That's not fair. You want a fair 
decision about whether your posting stays up or not. So we're going to want the AI to act fairly and reasonably in content moderation, a whole bunch of other things. The problem is that when we use obligations like this in law, when we talk about them in law, we don't try to define them. We don't try to define them in any clear way. There might be a few extra words, maybe setting out some constraints. So we must act with reasonable care, not just reasonably. But we don't go into any more detail than reasonable care or reasonable professional skill or whatever it might be. We leave that word reasonable there and we say, what does it mean? Everybody knows what reasonableness means, right? That's the thought. Reasonable is what you know, the ordinary human is supposed to be. We may, we, we may act unreasonably at times, but most of us think how we normally act is reasonable. Same with fairness. We all recognize unfairness when we see it. But anybody here think they can define fairness straight away? No, it's, it's a kind of difficult concept. Immediately, you ask that question. So instead of this, we explain them through examples. And those examples are always contextual. So if we're talking about me driving, they say, well, I was driving and it was a nice bright day and there was not much other traffic around, but I was sending texts on my phone as I drove. Was that reasonable care? No, we say it wasn't because I wasn't concentrating on the road. Right. Different context, I'm driving at night, it's dark, whatever it might be, yep. and I failed to put my headlights on. Right. Was that reasonable care? No, that's another example. But there's no rule that says, you know, well, headlights on is the rule, because this morning I didn't need my headlights on. It was daylight. Tonight I'll need them on because it's night. So all these things are contextual. That's another problem we have. And then when, as in law, we're assessing compliance, we don't define what compliance means in advance. We simply look after the event and we say, did the person we put the obligation on act in the right way? And, and with hindsight, we look back at what they did and we decide whether they were fair or reasonable or safe or whatever the other open text obligation is. And then we give you some help because judges answer these questions for particular bits of law and they explain their reasons and we gradually build up an understanding. But if you go to any lawyer anywhere in the world and you say, all right, your legal system as ours does has a law of negligence which says people must behave with reasonable care and skill. Right? What does that mean? They say, well, give me the context. Are you driving? Are you being a surgeon? Are you flying an aeroplane? Are you digging a hole in the road? What are you doing? Okay, now I've got the context. Let me give you some examples of the kind of things that are reasonably careful and not reasonably careful. That's how we do it. That's not a lot of help to computer scientists. Computer scientists would like some kind of clarity of definition. They need something to help them produce AIs which meet our open text standards. So what I'm gonna do is to start by explaining the problem in a little bit more depth. Then I will have a little look at how computer scientists try and do this. And we'll see where it falls very short of what we expect. And then I'll try and talk about what I've discovered about how we as, as people, as a society, understand fairness and finish up with some thoughts about how I think that might fit into writing law to regulate AIs to produce fairness. So it's quite ambitious actually. And I'm gonna try and finish in time so that we get some questions from you guys and comments and just thoughts to help me on my way with this. Okay, so next slide, what am I trying to, to find out? Well, I think I have to understand these concepts in more depth than we normally do. So if you ask me what fairness means, I could talk to you for ages, and I'm going to, about what fairness means, because I've been reading about it a lot. Legal writings really aren't helpful. They focus on the edge cases where we're not sure whether somebody is fair or unfair. So they don't talk about the core of fairness, what the heart of it is. They talk about the edges where it's uncertain. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a court case. If it was obviously unfair or obviously fair, we wouldn't go to law in the first place. So I have to find out what the core means. So I've been reading stuff by philosophers and sociologists and psychologists and economists to try and understand what this core conception of fairness is. That's one thing I've got to do. The other thing I need to try and do is to understand the role which context plays. And I 
had no idea about that till this morning. No, actually not till this morning, until about half an hour before this started when I thought, oh, I've just had a thought. And so that's in the slides and that's going to be useful for me later on. So I now have one thought about context. If I'm successful in my project, which is running the whole of this year, whole of this academic year, I want to be able to explain how we can make law and regulation in a way which allows computer scientists to build it into the AI. So we'll end up with AIs which are, to some extent, acting fairly reasonably safely and all the other things we're looking for. And I want to understand the trade-offs we might have to make, because it isn't going to be possible for the AI exactly to replicate what a human does. And we don't want that. We want the AI to be better than the human. That would be it. What was it? Uh, let's say 150 years ago, if you were in a horse and cart and you wanted to stop, you had a stick that pushed against the wheel with a leather pad. And if you pulled it hard enough, the cart would slow down a bit. Right. And that was the best a human muscle could do to slow down that thing. Right? Do you want your car's brakes of the same standard or would you like them better? We all want better. Right. We all want safer. Yeah. Early days of aviation. This is something I used to fly gliders until a year ago, so this is in my mind. But yeah, commercial aviation, passenger aviation began in 1918, just as World War I ended, because they, everybody was selling off their bombers. And what they did was to take the bomber aircraft, which were made of wood and fabric, and they basically put seats in them and said, OK, we can fly from London to Paris. Back in those days, roughly one flight in three failed to land at its intended destination. They didn't, didn't all crash. Right? Often they just landed in the field and you could, no one was injured. You could even reuse the aircraft. But you know, that was the kind of level of performance we got from aircraft back in 1918. 104 years later, uh, okay, sometimes the aircraft lands at another airport because of weather or whatever. But you generally expect to get there. And has anybody here been killed in an air crash? No, okay, right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of rare thing these days to, be, to have a crash where people are killed and injured. It's unusual. So we expect technology to get better and better. We want our AIs to be better decision makers. Right? But we'll need some trade-offs. We'll say sometimes we won't be able to know whether it's acting fairly or reasonably. We'll have to take it on trust. And I've written a whole paper on this about explaining stuff using XAI. Not going to go into that today. And we'll have to expect a minority of unfair and unreasonable decisions. I think it's inevitable. It's going to fail sometime, like humans fail. We don't have perfect human decision makers. We're never going to have perfect AI. So I'd like to understand how bad these trade-offs are. I don't know how far I can get with that. We will see. So why am I starting with fairness? Right. I started because I think it's the hardest one. I think it's the most complex. So if I can make some sense out of fairness, I can probably make more. I've got a good chance of understanding reasonableness and safety and justice and other concepts I want to think about. Second reason is computer scientists have done a lot of work about building fair artificial intelligences. There are hundreds, probably thousands of papers on this topic. I've read some of them. I've got to read more. So that enables me to find whether they are actually building stuff that, that lawyers would understand as fair and that society as general would understand as acting fairly. I'll explain why I think it's important in a moment. And then the other thing is I can find out about fairness from social scientists and philosophers because they've done a lot of work over the years on what these things mean. And they talk about context and try to explain it as well. So I need to understand all these things. And then finally, if it fails, if at the end of this I go, I'm stuck, right? I understand fairness and it's just too difficult to explain to an AI. Right? It's not the kind of thing computer scientists can cope with. Then at least I can switch to saying, all right, if I can demonstrate we can't build a fair AI, what other systems do we put in place to try to bring fairness back into the system? Now, one of the things that's obviously regularly mentioned is human review that says, OK, a decision, the AI makes a decision about you. You're unhappy with it. You should be entitled to human review of it. And then the human can decide if it was a fair decision. And that would work, except that it's slow, expensive, 
you know, where do we get all these decision makers from? Yeah, ideally, we'd like an AI to be fair to start with. So my hope is that I can understand this well enough to explain how to do it. I don't know. Um, is anyone else in the world working on this? Not that I know of, but there might be you know, people in the quiet corners, just wet towels wrapped around their head, steam coming off as they try and think about what fairness means. I'll find out eventually. Okay. Final sort of introductory point. There are two quite distinct kinds of fairness that we might think about. And we recognize these as lawyers. Um, the social scientists recognize them as well. So it's fairly clear distinction between process fairness and outcome fairness. Process fairness is about how the decision maker went about making their decision. So if we think of judges, because that's a typical decision maker for a lawyer, right? We go for judges. How do judges make decisions? Well, there are rules of procedure about what they must do. Yeah, that they, that they have to be presented with the materials from both sides. They, they have to conduct the hearings in a particular way. They have to give everybody a chance to put their point of view. They have to listen to arguments from both sides. Yeah, we have procedural rules that are designed to ensure that the hearing, that the decision is made in a fair way. But they don't say anything about the content of the decision. You know, as a judge, I could run a completely fair hearing and then give a completely unfair decision. The two aren't connected, right? but that's one kind of fairness. And that's really very well defined in law. Right? If anybody here is, you know, administrative lawyer, constitutional lawyer, you will have come across the procedural rules for litigation, the, the rules that lawmakers and other decision makers in public service have to go through, get a whole load of stuff in law. So I think it's quite easy to incorporate this in AI, but I haven't done the work yet, but I'm pretty sure that one's, that's an easy win. The hard one is outcome fairness. The result of the decision, is that a fair one? And from the reading, for reasons I'll explain in a bit, it's become clear to me that the only way we can decide if something is fair is to look at the emotions of the people who hear about it. Because fairness is an emotional feeling. Again, think back to when you were, what, five years old and your brother and sister got something and you didn't. Did it hurt? Yeah, I, it's, not, it's not just a, a rational thing. Well, that was unfair. I'll make note of it. Or, you know, future discussion with mother and father. No, it is a scream. It's not fair, you shout. It's, it's hurt you. It's painful. And the social scientists have, I think, fairly conclusively demonstrated especially the psychologist, that fairness is ultimately a feeling or emotion amongst society as a whole, and, and specifically the group of people who are subject to the decisions. That's who decides if something is fairness. This actually has strong links to, oddly enough, to the idea of legitimacy in, in making rules, right? that legitimacy is not something rule makers kind of grab for themselves. We give it to them. We are the subjects of the lawmakers, of the decisions, and it's up, to, we can reject the legitimacy of their laws. And we do sometimes. Um, just want an example, anybody here drive a car? A few people, okay. Any of those people never broken the speed limit? <laughs> just checking, you know, okay. So, so it has some legitimacy, but not, not in the precise words in which it's written. We have a nuanced view about what the law means there. And there are some laws that everybody disobeys and they just go, nah, nonsense. In extreme cases, you have a revolution and get a new government and get new laws. So, you know, there's a whole range of stuff. Right. Now, if outcome fairness can only be tested as the kind of emotional feeling of the people who, who receive the decisions, then obviously it's hard to define in law. And certainly we don't define it properly at all. And again, if we're asking an AI to kind of do something that meets the emotional needs of the people about whom it's making decisions. That's a hard ask as well. So we, we, we can already see we're probably not going to achieve it exactly. Can we achieve something that's enough like it to be workable? Okay, let's move on. Before I start, we need a quick peep into machine learning. Um, are you a computer scientist, not being a lawyer? Right, okay, so machine learning is a bit of a mystery to you? Very much so. Excellent, right, so 
the rest of you, obviously, I'm just reminding you of stuff you already know, but, but this is aimed at particularly you. Now, it's easy for us to think that an AI is a computer program that, that kind of knows how to do something. And, and if we ask ourselves, how do we know how to do things? We tend to say, well, I've got a kind of set of rules. You know, how, how, do I, how do I make a fried egg in the morning? I take a pan, I put it on the stove, I put some oil in it, I make sure it's hot enough, not too hot, I crack the egg in, it, I keep cooking it until it looks like this description of how your favorite kind of fried egg, I remove it from the pan before it goes hard, I eat it, right? So a set, yeah, set of rules, description of the process we go through. That's not how complex AIs work. They don't, they're not just a bunch of rules that we could set out and describe. Instead, the AIs that are really big and useful use the machine learning process where they train themselves from a set of examples. So you set up a program which can learn stuff and then you give it lots and lots of examples and you say, okay, Tell me the answer for these examples. Now, you're always asking it some question about them. So um, I have a PhD student who's working on liability for AI, which might kill you. And one of her early examples is distinguishing polar bears from other kinds of bears. Right. You all know what a polar bear is? Right. The white, really fierce ones. And then other kinds of bears, mixed fierceness, but none of that kind of Okay, but there we are. So two kinds of bears, polar bears, other bears. And the way you do it is you go, okay, AI, right? You're a kind of an, a learning computer program, right? Here are lots and lots of pictures of bears. Right? Tell me which ones are polar bears and which aren't. And to begin with, it just guesses and yet yeah, useless. So you tell it how it did. You've got it right on that one, wrong on that one, wrong on that one, right on that one, wrong on that one. And you keep going. And then it starts to get better. It, it, it changes the way it recognizes the difference and it gets better and better. And at some point, you're getting you know, 98% correct hit rate on polar bears and other bears. And you go, this is brilliant. Yeah. Okay, more to come later. Yeah, hold on to that question and see if I've explained the answer in a few minutes, if that's okay. If, in fact, some of these things actually already in the next slide, in, in, in this slide, because we've got this iterative process and it gets better and better. And the AI is configured, it configures itself inside as to how it's learning these things very hard to look into it and find out how it's learned it. So we find it very hard to get explanations out about how it made its decision. And you can demonstrate that if you can find counter examples to give it where it gets it wrong and you go, this is weird. So my PhD researcher, she says, yeah, the AI she's thinking of was really good until they showed it a picture of a polar bear outside its natural habitat in a zoo or something like that. And the AI said, oh, not a polar bear. And they went, what's going on here? And they realized that every picture of polar bear has the polar bear in snow. Right. And what the AI was doing was saying, is there snow in the picture? Yes, then it's a polar bear. If there's no snow, not a polar bear. Right. So then, you know, more training is needed. So it's not as simple as process saying you learn about it, because what it actually learned was white background equals polar bear. So you don't just train it, you also have to test it to find out whether it's got it right or not. It's not purely the machine going on on its own. The developers are busy nudging it in directions to try and get it there quicker. So they're having an input, their prejudices about bears or fairness are coming in at this stage. And also this, this data you train it on has to be labeled in some way. Yeah, the, the AI has to be able to say, well, this is, this is the animal, this is the background, right? This is what, this is the head, this is the foot. You need to help the AI to know what they're looking at. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of pixels in an image or a bunch of numbers in some other data. So let, let's imagine a different AI, one which is scoring people 
to decide if we'll interview them for a job. So we have data about their qualifications, about their previous experience, maybe their age, maybe not, different national laws here, and so on and so on and so on. Right. What do those numbers mean? Someone has to label them, someone has to define those categories. That's the developers. So the developers have a huge input into the, this process. Right. And as we'll see in a bit, well, next thing, okay, is when it's done, all it does is to match the training set. So what if the training set contains unfair decisions? What's the AI going to do? It's matching the training set, right? So there's actually a process of, of working on the training set to remove the unfair decisions. And then you've got to remember that the AI will only work to define fairness in terms of how it's already been decided in your training set and within the limits of that training set, whatever they are. So it's not as if your AI now understands fairness. What it's doing is it's saying, I will match the human decisions that were made in this particular domain. Now that might be good enough for us, but if we then look at the AI and say, all right, so how do we know it's fair? We don't. We don't have any way of getting a simple explanation out of it about how it decided something was fair. It will say, well, for this particular applicant, for a job, I gave particularly strong weight to their qualifications. I mean, it won't, it doesn't speak like that, but if we anthropomorphize it, if it could answer questions, it would say, I really thought the qualifications were very good for this one, and they outweighed these other two factors. But it wouldn't be able to tell us how it decided that was the fair answer. It would just say, look, this is, this is, this is what my training set told me to do. And we'll see in a minute that what the thing is trained against, the kind of factors that are used to decide training are, are critical to whether something produces a fair output or not. Bears are easy. You know, bears, you've got an animal and the background. Within the animal, you've got head, tail, paws, body. Right? In the background, you've got ground, sky, vegetation, other stuff. Right? None of that's controversial. No one's going to argue that you were wrong to say, well, we need to tell it which bits of the sky. When we're looking at fairness, as you'll see in a couple of slides, just the choice of what we think about to, de to determine these things is critical. So the fact that it's trained to match humans, that's over-egging it, that's overstating it. Right? It's trained to match humans if on the basis that they have made the right choice about the things the human did to use for the matching. Okay, I haven't explained it well, I can see already, but stick with me and I'll try and get a bit better. Now, this is where we get a problem when we come to lawmaking because a lot of lawmakers get excited by the idea that, well, okay, we can assess an AI by asking its developers to explain its reasoning. Now, there are, Two problems with that. One is that it's not reasoning in the sense that we understand as humans. Yeah, we tell stories about how we did things and why things happened and machines don't do that. It just did what it did. Right. And then the other thing is that, that the kind of things we can talk about why it made the decision the way it did don't really fit in with the kind of answers that humans want in order to assess fairness. They don't, they don't give us that kind of story that I would give you if I was telling you why it was fair that I'd given you a particular mark for a piece of work. You know, I would tell you a story that I would hope satisfied you. A machine couldn't do that. A machine would say, well, I've matched you against other pieces of work, and this is the number you get. Why is that fair? Well, it's fair because it matches the other kinds which were fair. You can see already the argument is a bit circular and it's not very satisfactory. You want a better answer than that. All right, so how do computer scientists try to make fair AIs in terms of outcome things? And this is a very simplistic view. I've just scratched the surface of what they're doing. Right? But the one thing that is clear from what I've read so far is that what they try and do is to search for mathematical ratios between groups. That is the whole of the fairness work that computer scientists do in AI. They say, we have a characteristic let's call it that, that we're interested in. For example, we want to be fair to both sexes 
in a job application system. So we look at the ratio of applicants, male to female, and we go, is it the same? Yes, then we've been fair in terms of male and female. Right. Is it very different? Yes, then we haven't been fair in terms of, uh, as between male and female. We've been biased towards one group or the other. And that, that's how fairness works in AI. Now, it's not as simplistic as that because there is no AI that's trying to filter job applications that just takes sex as an example or qualifications or whatever. That they'll take a range of characteristics and try to get accurate ratios between all of them. And you can see that starts to get more complicated. The first question you have is that is that is that good enough, right? Does if we do an aggregate analysis of, of decisions, right, that might tell us about the two groups, maybe, but maybe it doesn't tell us about the groups. I'll try and explain that in a moment. And the second thing is that are you happy that you've been treated fairly if you've been if you've been put into a group and treated like all the other members of that group? Or do you want an individual consideration of your circumstances? Like, do, you, do you feel you're enough different from the other members of the group? Because they're not identical, right? You're in a group called students, most of you. Right. Would you say you're identical? I'm looking around and you look quite diverse to me, right? There's a range of ages, there's a range of skin tones, there are a range of, of I, I don't know what I'm going to say. There are men and women and, and other people who I don't know how to describe. Maybe there are uh, ages, like 84, I discover, is my oldest inhabitant for today. Um, okay, no six-year-olds. But still, we're going down to well into the 20s, right? right? So, you know, we've got a range of people here. But you're all the same group. You're all the same participation in the class. With one or two exceptions, you're all students. Right. Do you all want to be treated exactly the same? for job applications, you know, I was a student at Queen Mary, so I'm one of a group. So long as it's fair to the group, it's fair to me. Doesn't feel satisfying, does it? You want to be individually treated. So we've got the problem of individual versus group. And the other thing is you've got a hidden disadvantage. I've given you an example up there. Um, the numbers are a bit small, sadly, but what I said is, okay, we've got this scoring system for job application CVs, those who meet the minimum mark are interviewed and the results are in. And from the last few groups of applicants, uh, we interviewed 80% of the white applicants and 16% of the non-white applicants, which is, you know, pretty close, right? Probably close enough that our AI is being fair as between white and non-white applicants. And we go, what about men and women then? We go, well, 24% of the men got interviewed and only 10% of the women got interviewed. We go, well, looks unfair, unfair, definitely. Then maybe we go, actually, it's doing a bit more than that because if we look at qualifications, we're in a field where women comparatively rarely and historically have gone into that field. Um, computer engineering would be a typical example. The ratio there still is something like in universities, still something like nine men to 10 women in your average computer science department. So you would expect on average men to have higher qualifications than women. So maybe it's not being unfair to the men. And it might be being unfair to the white applicants and the non-white applicants. What if it's throwing out, well, let's be honest, in, in this country anyway, it's more likely to be unfair to the non-white applicants. So let's assume that in the, we look at the non-white applicants and it's throwing out all the high scoring applicants. And it's keeping all the ones who are just above the minimum. So they get called for interview, but then they don't have the qualifications or experience to get the job. So actually, if we look at the jobs, we go, oh, 100% ah, white, 0% non-white. Guess what? We've got discrimination lurking here somewhere. Where was it? Was it in the interview process or was it back in the AI? So just looking at these raw numbers tells us a bit about what's going on, but doesn't tell us enough depth. And that's a real problem for computer scientists, and they're working hard on this at the moment. And they go, well, all right, we, maybe the answer is we look at more and more characteristics. Right. So for job application CVs, we don't just ask about 
whether you're a man or a woman, and we don't talk about your qualifications, and we don't just ask about your race, or we try, we try not to find out. How about we try not to find out about your, your race? But we ask where you were born. Oh dear, right, see, so already, because it's machine learning, it's matching patterns, it's looking at past applicants, right? So all our past applicants were born in the UK, and thus most of them were white, not all, but most of them. And now we have applicants from all, all over the world, born in different places, and it's going, yeah, hey, we haven't employed foreigners in the past, so we're not going to employ foreigners now. Right. The AI is not consciously doing this, it's matching the patterns in what we had in the past. So it, it's really challenging to computer scientists to know quite what it is they ought to be looking at. And certainly there are some assumptions underlying what they do. They're assuming that, you know, if, if we find a factor like sex or qualifications or whatever and give, give it a score to that, that somehow correlates with the thing that we're trying to be fair about. In the case of jobs, it's your ability or fitness to do the work. Yeah. But, you know, maybe actually your, your PhD doesn't that correlate with your ability to do this particular job at all work. So using it might even be unfair, number one. Right? Secondly, Choice of the appropriate factors to control for, that's not objective. It's quite clear that depending on what you choose to control for, you are making political choices with a small p. You are making choices about what you think is a good employee, what you think is a good candidate for surgery, what you think is a person who is unlikely to reoffend and shouldn't go to prison. And you build those in. You, your biases in choosing that, which you don't even know about, get built in with the choices you make. So that making the right choices is really difficult. Um, there's an assumption that equal ratios is, of groups is the same thing as fairness to individuals. And I think you can see immediately that's not true. Um, and a lot of the law, legal discussion in this area has been about groups versus individuals. Is it fair to base your decision on group statistics as a whole? Do you have to examine individuals on their own, forgetting about their membership of the group. And quite a lot of legal cases have turned on that when it comes to fairness. So these are things that we, we yeah, are mathematically difficult to cope with. And certainly the more factors we pick in, the more computationally complex it becomes. You know, if I've got two factors, with each with a yes, no answer in them, I've got four possible outcomes. If I've got three factors, I've got eight possible outcomes. If I've got 10 factors, I've got a thousand possible outcomes. Right. There comes a point when we put enough factors in that actually this AI it isn't doing pattern matching anymore. It's just going, well, I found the one example in my training data set that was exactly like this. And so I'm gonna treat this in the same way. It's not learning anything. It's just matching up on a really granular basis. That means that we have to decide, someone has to decide between competing fairness norms. You know, if we're looking, say, at race equality and sex equality, which do we do first? If there's a clash between them, if we had a group of job applicants and the AI says, well, I might, I'm gonna favor either men against women or white people against non-white people, which is the right answer? That's not a computer scientist question, is it? That's a a law and policy question that, that other people ought to be deciding. And again, with societal policies, you know, we, we all agree to some extent, differing extents, that people who are disadvantaged should get some weighting on that basis, should get some, some level of preferential treatment. Yeah, they should get that taken into account. Uh, an example might be education. You know, if you come from a rich background, we expect you to have a, a high quality education. If you come from a really poor background, it was quite hard for you to get an education. So we could argue that maybe a high score by a less educated person might be worth more than the same score by a highly educated person. But that's, again, not an objective decision to make. That's making a policy decision about what is and isn't fair. And then we have affirmative action, which is in many countries, the idea that actually we should discriminate in favor of some groups because historically they've been discriminated against, suffered disadvantage. Right. How do we build that in to our AI in order to make a fair decision? So it really is quite tough, a lot more to research here. 
But it should be obvious that just looking at ratios between groups isn't going to be how societal fairness or legal fairness works. But I'm enjoying this so much, I've just looked at the time. I've got to go quicker or we're not going to finish by, uh, is it, by, by 5.30. Hmm. Okay, so let's come on to the social science side. Like, what have I learned from social scientists and philosophers? Like, it's been actually a really interesting journey just finding out about fairness. There's stuff I've left out, like the evolutionary biologists who talk about the origins of fairness in hunter-gatherer societies and yeah, how, how sharing resources increases survival and thus the people who share most have most children and therefore children are more likely to share and we grow up a sharing norm. So, yeah. we, let's take as given that we have an inbuilt desire for fairness as humans. Right? It's very rare to find a human who doesn't want stuff to be fair. Right? Then fairness seems to be about sharing resources. And those resources could be almost anything. Could be money, could be employment, could be opportunities like medical treatment or education, could even, I guess, be sharing pain. Um, there's a lot of talk in the AI world outside computer scientists about what's called the trolley problem for self-driving cars, where they go, self-driving car is driving down the road and an accident is inevitable. It is going to hit three nuns on a pedestrian crossing or six children and a kitten uh, on the side of the road. Which is it going to choose? How is it going to make a fair choice between which group to mow down? Now, it's a nonsense problem because our self-driving car doesn't know their nuns, doesn't know their children, doesn't rise to the kitten, isn't deciding which group to hit. It's working all the time saying, can I avoid a collision? If it's saying anything at all and it will hit whichever one it hits. It's not making a decision, it's a nonsense question. Right. But that kind of fairness question might be, all right, yeah, like we have one kidney and three patients who could receive it. Which two are going to die? We need a fair answer to that question. So these are the kind of things we're talking about, money, employment opportunities, other stuff. That's what fairness is about. And a lot of the work that's been done by the social scientists is about voluntary sharing within communities, how families share, how groups of friends share, and so on and so on. Right. But a lot of that carries over to sharing, which is decided by decision makers who are imposed on the group or elected by the group. People like judges, regulators, the, the people who make decisions about stuff in everyday life. And from that reading, I find there are three things that come out of it, three things that are important. One is that fairness, the core of fairness seems to be this idea of the quality of treatment. That's right at the core. Secondly, we need to understand power and status. They play a much bigger role than you think in deciding what's fair. And thirdly, because it's an emotional feeling in the hearts of the people who find out about decisions, how do we make fairness convincing to them? How do we convince them that we've done this fairly? And if you think about it from a legal perspective, that's really important. Yeah. If we've got a system that's fair, but everybody believes isn't, it's unsatisfactory, isn't it? Imagine a court. Yeah. The court is perfectly fair decisions and everybody thinks it's completely biased and rubbish. Right. Then our legal system is failing. So we have to convince people that what we're doing is fair. Let's look at each of these three in turn. Then. Right. Equality of treatment. Okay, well, what that seems to mean is we have to treat individuals in the same way as we treat other people who are in the same subgroup, the same description. So, yeah, subgroup, we have to treat all students the same. That seems okay, right? We have to treat all women the same. We have to treat all men the same. We have to treat all Indians the same. We have to treat all Nigerians the same as other Nigerians. We mustn't say, okay, you're my favorite Nigerian. I really like you, you're my favorite woman. In, in the... That's not allowed. We've got to treat everybody similarly. And actually within the student things, we go, to be honest, whether you're Nigerian or Indian or English or pick a nationality should make no difference at all. We treat you all the same way. And so that's what we try to do. Right. And that seems to be an aspect of fairness. But simultaneously we say, however, 
individuals might deserve different treatment in some cases. Right. You will all discover that, if you don't already know it, the system of extenuating circumstances for your assessments. So you won't. If you're your part, thank goodness you've passed that stage. No more exams. Right. But this lot, yeah, I used to be chair of the exam board. I, I gave that up at last, thank goodness. But every year, lots of people say, I need extra time for my assessments because I had dyslexia. I ought to get different treatment because serious family illness meant I had to leave the country and was away for three weeks. So I ought to get special treatment and so on and so on. I'm not going to give you a menu of ideas, but you can see immediately that we go, yeah, actually, those examples are good ones. Someone who is dyslexic ought to get a bit more time. Yeah. Someone whose mother or father nearly died and they were away for four weeks looking after the family really ought to get some consideration, oughtn't they? That's only fair. Right. So equality of treatment, except that if you deserve different, you should get different. Right. That's what. And then if we say, OK, well, if we're talking about merit here, what amounts to merit? That's not objective at all. That's culturally and socially determined. Depends on your society as to what counts as merit. So ability, yeah, your innate ability, like your strength, your skill at something, your cleverness, that might be seen as merit. You get a stronger share because you're cleverer or because you're stronger or quicker or whatever it might be. Okay? That might be. But would it be fair, for example, if we go, well, you're the fastest runner in the class. We're going to give you high marks. Okay. No, hang on a minute. No, no, that's an innate ability, but it's not fair to account that on your marking. Right. Effort. Yeah. A lot of work saying effort is one of the things, especially economists. Economists love effort. Right. Economists say the more effort you put in, the more you deserve. That's great. It's kind of that's built into all the Adam Smith and other stuff saying, hey, you strive more, you work hard, you, you, you ought to get a bigger share of the resources. If you've earned it, you deserve it. That's an effort to think. But again, you know, we, we applaud your effort as students, but if you don't hit the mark, we don't give you the mark, sorry. So, you know, effort doesn't count for us, but it might well count in other fields. It might entitle you to different treatment, yeah. give you some merit. Right. Choices made. A lot of also economists like this one about choices. People say, well, people have chosen to spend their money on having fun rather than investing in education. So the people who invested in their future have a reason for getting more. And we don't give compensation to people who, who lost all their money on a horse race and spent the rest on drink. You know, we go, sorry, but that was your choice. Right. So that's, that's another kind of merit that we think about. Interesting one, social status and power. Some societies think that if you're important social status, you ought to get more, bigger share. Yeah, professors get bigger pieces of cake. Right. Trivial example, but all right, in, in some cultures, rich people should get more money because being rich is a sign of merit and worth and so forth. Right. Power, power certainly does that. Right. We often collectively think it's okay, powerful people got more. That's fine, they're powerful. They kind of ought to get more. Yeah. Elon Musk has got more than us. Okay, bad example. Nobody thinks Elon Musk ought to get more. But yeah. They, they, sorry? Banksters. Yes, yes. Okay, that kind of thing. And then finally, disadvantage stuff you couldn't help. Like that, your family, you were born into a poor, poor family. You couldn't help being born into a poor family in a, in a town where there was really bad education if you didn't have money. You couldn't help that, so we should somehow compensate you for that in our decisions. You were born with a physical disability. So again, we should take that into account when making our decisions, those kind of things. So huge differences, and these aren't the same in every society. I'm sure if we dug into them, that we've got people here from, I don't know, 20, 30 different countries maybe, um, we find in each of them, we have some subtle differences about what we think is fair in those characteristics. And then also the contact makes a difference. So if times are good and there's lots of money floating around, we can reward efforts. Right? If it's a famine and everybody's starving, then it doesn't really matter how, how much effort you put in, in the past, we give the food to the people who need it most. Right? That's kind of how fairness changes with context. So yeah, good times, I can have the biggest piece of cake. Right? If we're starving, 
same size piece for everyone. In fact, yeah, given that I'm not, not thin and skinny, maybe I get less cake because I've got, you know, you get less cake. Who's, who's the skinny one? The skinny ones here get more cake because they're feeding up to survive the famine. I don't know. Right. But you, know, you can see the fairness changes there. And then so I talk about individuals. So they get treated the same as the member of their group. Bear in mind that assigning you to groups is not a neutral thing. That's already a political decision of a kind. And then also, as between subgroups, we've got to do fair sharing, sharing in accordance with merit. So we might say, OK, you know, coming to the seminar, PhD students deserve to come more than LLM students who deserve to come more than people just walking off the streets and want to find out what this is about. Or the other way around. We could do it the other way around. It doesn't matter. But we have to, accordance with merit, who deserves to come to the seminar most? Not a, not a question anybody would actually ask, but if we had to ask it, yeah, we want something based on merit for deciding a fair system. And certainly when we're controlling for things like disadvantages, the decision about what we control for is socially determined. Yeah, the UK says, okay, we control for disability, we control for race, um, we don't really control for poverty. Other countries might say, Historically, we have no real reason to control for race, but controlling for poverty could be quite important. We ought to do that. So we have culturally determined things and socially determined decisions. And one role of the law is to counter this. So that's why the UK in my lifetime has introduced laws about sex discrimination and race discrimination. Uh, when I was at school, both of those were perfectly legal. Yep, I know, that, that's how far, okay. I'm not that old, well, I am that old, but even so, yeah, in, in one lifetime, we have moved from, it's fine to discriminate on grounds of race and sex to it's seriously wrong, and lots of laws against it, and fair decisions don't do that. So, and the law led that, you know, when, when the first law on race relations came in, in 1968, uh, you would probably have not, necessarily found a majority of the UK voting population who would have voted in favour for it. The law led social attitudes. Now, if, if we were voting to repeal it, we might get 1% of nasty people saying, yeah, get rid of the law. Yeah, that's how far we moved. Same with sex discrimination. Yeah, these are things that have now become duh obvious, right, but weren't when they were passed. Um, and this is also a machine, machine learning issue because the reason we develop these legal norms, things like fundamental rights, is because humans don't follow fairness norms in practice. That's why we say, oh, you must allow free speech, you must respect privacy, you must yeah, do this and that. Okay. So if we're just machine learning from what people do, we entrench all the bad things they currently do, the law says they shouldn't do. So actually, we need a cleaning up of the training data or something to bring in these legal norms that the society has decided should try to improve the way people behave and build those into our fair decision-making systems. Okay, so it's difficult. All right. Third point, making fairness convincing. All right. What I get from the social science reading is that we don't make absolute discussions about fair, decisions about fairness. We don't judge it in absolute terms. We don't look at the decision in isolation and say that was fair or that was unfair. We're looking at kind of a range of the other decisions we know about in a similar area. And we're saying, are they like each other? Yeah. Are there reasons why this one is different from the others? We're comparing other decisions. And comparison therefore means we need information about how others were treated by the decision maker, right? what the outcomes were, what the process was. And then we as a society look at those and we go, they seem about right. So, you know, I'm not saying that, that we all know lots of criminals, but we all read and in the press or watch on the television or whatever, enough about criminal trials and criminal processes that we have a view about whether, generally speaking, they're fair. And then if we have a particular one that hits public attention, we might look at it and go, I feel that one's unfair. And the reason it's unfair is it stands out from the others as being too different from the rest. That's how we decide fairness. It might be the process was wrong compared to what normally happens, or it might be the outcome seems completely wrong. 
you know, everybody else who was convicted of theft that I've heard of in the last six months got a sentence of between one year and two years, and this person has got 50 years in prison. What's going on? That doesn't seem fair. Now, maybe you look at it in detail and go, yeah, actually, it's fair. They stole a lot of stuff. But yeah, probably not. So that but it's your comparison. When you look into it in a bit more depth, it tells you whether it's fair or not. And if fairness isn't objective, it's subjective state or quality in the minds of the people who are subject to decisions. And it's based on the outcome and the process of decision. Then two questions come to my mind. One, is it enough that most people see it as fair? Or have I got to try and convince everybody? And I, I don't know the answer to that. And in particular, if I look at the legal test for fairness, I think that what they're trying to do is to convince the world that most of these are fair, that this is mostly fair, and individual decisions that aren't are kind of outliers. But I'm not sure. This is something I've got to find out more about. And there's a second thought coming out of the readings, which is that if you're the subject of a decision, you know, if you go to court and get a judgment, how many other court judgments have you got to compare yourself against? Have you sat in the court for six months looking at other decisions like your case to see if they're the same as yours? Probably not. You're quite ignorant about the way other people are treated, but you know quite a bit about the process. Yeah, there's documents about how it ought to work and stuff. So you know more about the process and how other people, does everybody get the same process? Yes, that's, that's part of fairness. So there's some academic work that suggests that actually in making this kind of emotional decision about fairness, people are more influenced by procedure because it's a kind of proxy for the things they don't know. They go, well, I don't know how other cases were decided, but I know they were all decided the same way. So that gives me some confidence that they were probably fair as well. But, you know, if fairness norms are culturally determined, then what's a fair process is probably culturally determined as well. I mean, I would have to sit down with people from half a dozen different countries in a room for a couple of hours and say, okay, talk me through judicial process in your country. Uh, not just the theory, but what really happens. You know, is your country one where, to be honest, the judge expects to be visited by representatives of the litigants with presence? Because um, if they are, that's the real process. So culturally determined, you know, or is it the kind of place, country where, like, like, say, Sweden would be, but if anybody visited a judge with a bag of money, they'd be arrested on the way out because the Swedes, no, the Denmark, actually the Danes, the Danes are the world's most law-abiding people. By my, my objective test, which was me crossing the road and being shouted at because I wasn't using a pedestrian crossing. It was six in the morning. There was no traffic for miles, but I was still bad man because I didn't obey the rules and go to the crossing. Right, so that's Denmark, most law-abiding country in the world. So, you know, what's fair process? That probably isn't objective. That's also a culturally determined thing. Okay, so that's what I've learned. And I thought, it's all very well telling you that. And you go, well, that's all very interesting, but we're lawyers. Could we have a bit of law in this talk? Yeah, please. So I thought, okay, let me think then about how we might make useful AI regulation. Have I learned any initial thoughts? And this is what I wrote down this morning on the train coming in. So that's just the process of having to talk to you guys has already produced this understanding. Um, first is that equal treatment seems to be at the core. Right? That's what the social scientists say fairness is about. That's what the computer scientists work on for fairness. I think that's what the lawyers work on for fairness as well. So equal treatment seems to be important. But deciding what factors we test for inequality is not objective. That's very much a decision with a kind of political agenda or a social agenda. I don't know how to describe it, but you have a normative view about what's good and bad, and you're building that in just in the choice of what you test for to make your equal treatment comparison. So we can't just leave it to the computer scientists to take a guess and say, well, I guess that this is a job application system. So we probably should somehow rule out sex discrimination and race discrimination, I guess. Um, 
we're looking for ability to do the job. So what factors do we think are about ability? And then what else do we want to put in that might help us? Hobbies? I don't know. Yeah. What is it that would make a good employee? Niceness? Have we got measures for niceness? Everyone wants nice colleagues. Yeah. yeah. We asked the question, yeah. if you had a big cake, how much would you give to your friend? Right. There we are. And then that answer will tell us, will give us a score for niceness. But we can't leave that completely to the computer scientists because how are they to know what meets society's needs and particularly the law's needs, which is maybe trying to make society fairer. So we'll have to specify some of the required factors and they won't be the same for all the air applications. So if we're allocating a kidney for transplant, we're not going to ask the same questions as if we're giving someone a job, right? Different things we're asking about. So we'll, we'll have to, to, to make the law and regulation very granular. We'll have to think about different domains of application and give guidance of some kind to the people who are developing AIs. And I think too many factors are going to make AI unworkable. My example of, you know, if you've got eight factors, that is a thousand possible combinations of yes, no at the end of the day. That may make it so granular it's not actually doing any assessment. It's just matching one pattern in the past. But I don't know. I've got to research into that to find out how many comparison factors the computer scientists can reasonably work with. I've not seen any of the papers working with more than about four or five, beyond which it starts to get very complex. Something that I don't fully understand and need to is labeling of training data. Because I think that's a place where prejudices, ideas about how society would work get embedded as well. So I don't know what we do about that. Well, I, I do on the next slide. I think I know. But I, I have to do enough reading and check whether that's right. Certainly, the technical specification of fairness factors is not neutral either. I mean, so in employment selection, AI wants to select the candidate with the best qualifications. So um, you have a PhD in whatever it is, and the other person has, a, an, uh, you have a PhD in law, the other person has a degree in engineering and uh, various professional qualifications in computer science. Which are the best qualifications? So just specifying, you know, what's the best in here? is not neutral. We're going to give a score to each of those. We'll have to work out how we're going to score them. Right. That's not a neutral process. Right. And then is there a hierarchy of fairness factors? Do we take, do we, should we start with inherent disadvantage? Because that's always needs to be compensated for and kind of push stuff like, I don't know, um, we might say it, sex goes down the list. It's, it's less important than race. That's a, it's a difficult one, actually. Which is worse, sex discrimination or race discrimination? I think most people in the UK would say race discrimination is worse than sex discrimination. But if you asked us why, I don't know if we could tell you why. Because there's no legislation on racial discrimination. Race Relations Act 1968. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, sex, sex Discrimination Act 76, from memory. Well, yeah, yeah, but remember, you, you have, no, I was going to say you have no way of checking. You'll have Google. Don't Google it. I might have got that wrong. But I think, I think it's 68 for race, race discrimination and 76 for sex discrimination, I think. No, I, but the answer, I don't know. But I think that's what we decide, that kind of, if, if we have to have a hierarchy, then race anti-race discrimination wins out in the fairness states. But if we just ask the women, what would they say? I don't know, is it? So, you know, things we have to decide as a society. And then what are the implications for how we'd implement regulation? Well, the obvious thing for lawmakers, because lawmakers are very simple people, right? Uh, driven by political factors. Will this get me a headline? Will I get the sound bite? Will I be reelected next time round? Those are the things that mainly drive politicians. So they say it's easy, we'll just say, your AI must make fair decisions. There we are, that's the law. And we'll do that. 
Now, the thing is, if we're going to make do that in a way that's workable, we've got to specify the fairness factors that are required in great detail. Otherwise, we're going to have an unjust system that says, you have to achieve fairness. If you don't, you will be fined or otherwise punished. And we can't tell you what you have to do to avoid it. OK, that immediately is an unfair legal system. Yes, we know that. So we've got to get lots of detail, computational complexity. Worse, we get to tick box compliance. Any data protection lawyers here? Yeah, one, one or two. OK, if any of you study data protection, you'll see that it has grown into a monster that has so many detailed obligations that in order to prove you've complied, you tick lots of boxes. And it's so easy to say, I've ticked all the boxes, job done. Right. Rather than thinking back about what it's about, which interestingly is about the fair processing of personal data, undefined. Though there are cases which I've got to read again to find out what it means. And yeah, do we want rate developers to understand the regulations and tick the boxes? Or do we want them to think about how to make their AIs act fairly? I know what I think the answer is, but you know, I have to decide that one. And then, even then, we know that we can't specify every possible factor and cover every situation. So there will be unfair decisions. And if we can't predict when it's going to make unfair decisions, then it's quite possible society won't accept those AIs as acting fairly. So I don't like the idea of saying, hey, achieve fairness or we'll hit you with a big stick or fine you or whatever. The alternative then might be an obligation to take care and skill, exercise care and skill to achieve fair decisions. So it's not absolute, it's a care and skill obligation. Right? And we can cope with that because these are human developers and we test them against other humans. And we say, are you doing it with the same care and skill that these other humans would do it with? That's how we assess reasonable care for humans. So that's easy. Uh, and we give them guidelines, obviously, which we'd update regularly. Right? And these would guide developers. They also guide the courts and regulators who are making decisions about whether people have met the obligation. So, you know, the guidelines said you should have checked your training data to make sure that it didn't have unintentional bias on the following matters and you didn't check it for anything. Right. You're an idiot. You didn't take reasonable care and skill because the guidelines said you should have done this. And it's obvious you should not. So it helps both sides. Maybe we'd specify the most important fairness factors. You know, so maybe maybe for, for kidney transplants, it, it's it's qualies, the uh, quality of life. Uh, yeah, it, it is qualitatively life adjusted years. In other words, believe it or not, there is now a formula for looking at every one of us and saying, yeah, you've got X qualies left in you. It looks at your lifestyle, your health, and all the rest of it, and says, okay, yeah, you're a 40, you've got, you've got 40 years of good life ahead of you, and then you get ill and sick, and it's not good. So we don't count those, right? And depending on various facts in your lifestyle, we get different answers. And that might be a good one for a kidney transplant, you know? So we look at this eight-year-old child, and we go, this eight-year-old child is perfectly healthy. They have, on current predictions, probably 90 qualies ahead of them. I am no longer eight years old. I have many fewer qualies in me. I don't get the kidney. That's probably a good metric to put in there. Right. Should it be the only one? Maybe not, because I'm, I'm more used to society than the eight-year-old. Well, I, I make more noise collectively than the eight-year-old. That's all I can say. You know, maybe they, But they could grow up into a brilliant researcher and do better stuff than I do. So who knows? Right. Or we could take something like the Singapore approach, which is quite interesting. They've got very comprehensive guidelines on developing ethical AI, which includes ideas of fairness. Uh, they're really good. Um, the, the guys in charge of the regulations, a former graduate from our courses, hooray. Uh, thank you, Zeke, lovely guy. Um, and he really understands this stuff well, in my view. So what the Singapore approach does, it says, we've got no regulations, we've got no laws, we've just got guidelines for you. And these are high level objectives for developers with quite a lot of guidance about how to use care and skill and good practice to achieve them. And you're trying to achieve AIs which act fairly, which are ethically, which produce safe answers, which are good, which are efficient, all the rest of it. But Singapore is a very particular culture. It's a very small place. Uh, people are immensely close together. Uh, 
business and government talk to each other in a way that they don't in other parts of the world. Um, it's often said that business is part of the Singapore government, even though it's not formally there in the constitution. It is a partnership between government and business. And realistically, if Singapore wants to change its law to find developers who don't comply with the code, it could do that tomorrow. No, it couldn't, because tomorrow is a Saturday. All right, but you know, it could, uh, Zeke could make a few phone calls tomorrow morning, and on Monday, the Singapore Parliament would pass the legislation necessary. And the developers know that, and they talk to him all the time. So that's why Singapore works. I'm not sure it would work in cultures which work in a different way. And, and to be honest, yeah, my knowledge of Singapore's culture, that, that's, a, that's gross. I'm sure it's much more complex than that. But there are certainly elements of it being almost like a family relationship between the people involved, rather than the arm's length relationship you get in a bigger country uh, with different views. So final slide then. <laughs> How much time for discussion? Mm, we'll see. All right, where am I going next? Um, well, I started by assuming we have to somehow align AIs with our social norms. And it's obvious we can't make them match completely, to my view. But I think we could accept some level of mismatch. Yeah. Just as an example, if you take the United States, in some US states, there is mandatory imprisonment for certain offences. Right. There are some offences for which the judge cannot choose not to send you to prison. And that's almost certainly unfair to some individuals, but is accepted by society as collectively fair to the group of people who commit those offences. So maybe we can accept some mismatches. We can say at the group level, this is good enough, and we accept some individual failures if there aren't too many. Um, law is focused on a subset of fairness norms, and I know it's got strong rules on procedure, but I need to find out more about what it says about outcomes. Right? And it says different things in different areas, but I'll be looking at data protection law, fairly obviously. Um, I think I'll be looking at financial services and insurance. There are fairness obligations there. Um, certainly, they'll be looking at some elements of the criminal process uh, but that's mainly procedure rather than anything else. So I'm going to be looking around for fairness obligations and trying to see what different ones look like in different contexts. And maybe from that, I might find out the law actually has a reasonably clear view about what outcome fairness means. And I can start to match that up with the society's view and what the computer scientists do and see if I can somehow make them all work together. Right. I need to think about group fairness norms. Right. Um, because if, if we're looking at group fairness norms, we have to think about the context that we're working in. Can it capture that? Can it capture culture? If we just look at yeah, treating individuals, groups the same, yeah. do we treat men and women the same? Does, that, does culture make a difference there? Does context make a difference there? I won't go into that, but yeah, big political debate about, about gender neutral toilets. Right. And guess what? Yeah, context and culture is huge there. Right. So whichever side you take in, in that debate, it's not it's not a neutral position to be in. Okay. There's an argument I've come across by by some theoreticians that say actually group fairness incorporates individual fairness, although to us lawyers, it feels completely different. Individual fairness is about looking at everything that's relevant about the individual. Group fairness is about saying you're a member of a group and this is how that group is treated. And that doesn't feel like it's the same, but I've come across an argument that it is the same. And it's quite a complex argument. I need to work on that and see if that's just one weirdo academic out having a nice idea or whether it's something other people join in with and say, yeah, there's something in this. Um, and then what is context here? And I wonder if, and this is my speculation, not long ago. Uh, is context, in fact, something we capture by the fairness factors? In other words, yeah, if we're looking at, say, the kidney transplant, me and the eight-year-old child, right, the context around that is what's the benefit to the person of giving them the transplant? Well, obviously, much more to the child than to me. They're going to get more use out of a kidney than I will if they live to their expected lifespan. There are other elements like utility to society. There are other elements like, for example, I'm really sick and the child's only just getting sick and another kidney might come up. So mine is more urgent. Right. 
I'm wondering if, if the fairness factors we build in effectively build the context in. And I've, it just occurred to me that it feels like it might, but I can't say whether it does or not. So I'm working on that. And then once I've answered all these questions and the others I'm going to find out, I'm hoping I can identify how law can man mandate fairness in AI decision making and what it can't ask AI to do, which is equally important. And if that's all I achieved this year, I've done quite well. But ideally, you know, sometime in February, I can say, crack this one. I'm on reasonableness now. Yeah, next month's safety and then on to something else. So that's the seminar. How much law in it? Some accidental bits, right. but quite a lot about law. I hope. Now, we're pretty much at the finishing time. If anybody wants to go, that's great. Yeah, questions, lovely, because I would like any questions, comments, ideas you have. We can have the room until six. So we've got another half hour if we want it. But if anybody has somewhere they ought to be, or just they, they'd like to be, then please, by all means, you know, I won't be offended if anybody goes, waves, wave politely as you go. That's all I'm asking. Right. Your second question. You've got first question. Yeah, I haven't mentioned the concept of a black box because it's become clear over the last few years that black boxes are more see-through than we've realized or can be made more see-through. Um, there is a whole discipline in computer science called XAI, which stands for Explainable Artificial Intelligence. And these are tools which tell you something about how the black box AI is making its decision. In the early days of machine learning, you change your AI, and then it's, it would give you answers. And if you looked inside at the workings to say, why is it giving these answers? There was no clue. Just a bunch of weights and a network that appeared to have random, have no meaning that you could find out. Now we have tools that can dig inside it. So you're saying that they can make decisions as well? No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm saying that we, we can get an increasing amount of information about what, what it is that is influencing the AI to make that particular decision. The difficult question is, is how we use that information and how we link it up to what humans require, like judges and regulators and so forth. If you're interested, uh, if you do a Google search for um, my name and non-Asimov explanations. You read that one. OK, but you read the paper and you still believe in black boxes. <laughs> Maybe I should rewrite it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I probably didn't, didn't use the word black box there. It's become quite unfashionable in the field now. It's, it's old hat, but yeah, yeah. But no, that, that is the thing that we, we now get some idea about how they're working. But one of the, the, one of the points that I made in, in that article is that as, as, as from a legal perspective, we look for narrative explanations from people. So if you're in a car crash and you're giving evidence about the car crash, you will say things like, well, I was driving along and I did this and I thought that and I saw that and then suddenly this happened and then and then and then there was this big bang. Right. And that was the crash. So you're giving a story about how it happened. That's how we explain stuff as humans. Okay. And what I, I think is that we got socialized by the science fiction writers of the 50s and 60s, like Isaac Asimov, and maybe particularly the film 2001 A Space Odyssey with Hal the computer, which goes mad and, and takes over control of the space station. Like, okay, now you've not seen it. This piece of history that like, came out in 2001, I think. Yeah, so 21 years old. Anyway, that one. Right, so two th that kind of thing led people to think that AI would be able to tell a story about how it, why it decided things. Uh, Star Wars, right? C3PO, the android. Yeah, C3PO, right? Yeah. What does he do? He's got this lovely cultured voice and says, Yes, well, Master, I rather thought that so and so would happen, and therefore I did X and Y, explaining his AI brain thoughts. 
That's not what happens. Right? We get data out from the XAI that says, well, probably, probably in this thing, that the most influential factor was the age of the person, but their qualifications played a small part, and this and that played no part at all in the decision. That's the kind of information we get out. So it's not, it's not what we're used to. And then the rest of the article is about, well, can we live with it? Do we need to have it in narrative format? Um, and so on. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So that was the first question. Yes, yours. Well, thank you. Okay, well, I promise you that, that if I can't answer it now, I won't answer it by now either. <laughs> so it'll save you sending me the email in the first place. What's the question? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm surprised they have to think about it because the way machine learning is conducted ought to deal with the Karl Popper question, ought to deal with the falsification of data. Just, uh, right. yeah. Because what happens is this, that you have your, your set of training data, you use that to train your AI. Effectively, you're building a hypothesis. This, is, this particular configuration of the system will produce the kind of decisions we're looking for. That's your hypothesis. No, that, and that, that's also an important question. And there, there's a lot of work has been done and is continuing to be done by computer scientists on how to make sure, well, A, make sure you have a representative training data set, which is not easy. Right? And the second is how to adjust it for the, any things that you have to adjust it for. In my example, things like race, race discrimination or sex discrimination or whatever, which will be in there if it's human decisions. Now, I, I agree that the one thing you're not going to do is ever have a perfect training data set. And I'm not sure how you would go about falsifying it, because all you have is examples of what has happened in the past. Right? Those examples are true in that sense, that they don't contain false information. Their problem might be they're not representative enough of the problem that you're trying to understand and produce a solution to. The, because they don't see it as hypothesis testing. That, that stage one of the, the training, you produce your model, which if you like, contains the hypothesis, even if we can't understand quite what it is. Then you have a training, a testing system, which is trying to disprove it. So you're trying to give it cases where it's going to produce the wrong answer. And if it does, then you can retrain it. No, no, I, I, I didn't spend much time at all on testing. Yeah, no, any proper machine learning production of AI puts as much or more weight on testing. And then actually there is, if you like, the testing and use. There should be monitoring and use and all the strange answers that come in that are clearly not what we're looking for should lead to retraining of the AI. So it's an iterative process, getting closer to 
I won't use the word truth because we're not looking for truth in this. We're looking for achievement of a social objective. We're looking for a car that can drive better than a human, for example. Right. That's not a truth. That's a, that's a thing we're trying to achieve. Thank you. No, not at all. Thank you for coming. Right. Does anybody else have questions? And they can be observations to you too. We've got, oh, no, your hand did go up first. I saw it and then it went down again. So you, then you, then you. Right. Okay. Three of you. Yeah. I'm going to come back in because I'm making a recording. So if I do this, I can say I had a question from the back. I have to step away to hear it because there's the, the air conditioning is really noisy this end. Um, and it's from Vanessa, isn't it? Vanessa? No. OK. I say other PhD student. It's it's someone it's from one of our PhD students who is working on uh, fairness uh, and employment and AI. Right. And I'm doing her second question first. Her second question was. Does fairness mean the same thing in different contexts? For example, does fairness in insurance mean the same thing as fairness in AI? And the answer is no. Simple. No, it doesn't. Right. However, you know, the underlying process for making a fair decision might be the same. So you're looking for equivalent treatment. You're looking for some kind of merit-based adjustments, right? but the merits will be different. The, the things you're looking for equivalence on will be different in each context. So the answer is no, it's not the same, but maybe the way of producing it will be the same. Okay. So when we talk about the fairness AI, do we uh, fit the different definitions when we reflect on the context? Well, now that, that's a hard question. So I mean, if you were submitting your thesis in, in six months time and said, should I refer to a fairness AI or what should I say? I'd be going, can you wait? Could you wait till I finish this research? Because I don't know the answer. Um, but I think talking about a fairness AI is, is, is a very generic concept. I mean, you could use it by which you mean an AI, which the people subject to its decisions generally think is fair. That's what you mean by it. If you were then saying, I want to use it to mean an AI that does particular things in a particular way, I think that would be dodgy because it, it won't in different fields. It'll be doing quite different things in different ways. Yeah. So your first question, right, can I remember the first question? Ask me again. <laughs> the difference of between the fairness and the equality. Yeah, yeah, right, fairness and equality. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. I've been thinking about it in terms of bias, which I guess is, is similar in a way, but it's not quite the same. It, equality is a positive thing that we're trying to achieve. Right? Bias is a negative thing. So if you, if you were to say, in English law, is, is there a bias against women? We'd go, probably not. Right? Is there equality between when, men and women? Well, we don't seem to have achieved it yet. So again, probably not, in spite of the lack of bias. So there is some difference between the two of them. Um, I think equality is, an, is an, a state in society that we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yes. And fairness is one of the routes towards equality. I think that may be the difference between them. So, yeah, you, you cannot have equality in society if one group is being treated unfairly compared to another. Right. That wouldn't be an equal society. On the other hand, even if all the groups are being treated fairly, there might be other reasons why society is unequal. But, so, uh, so, uh, 
I think it's doing different things, okay? It, equality is, is a, a description of, of a state of society. That's how I put it, I think. It's kind of aspiration for society. So we're aspiring to achieve an equal society. And then you want to say, well, what do we mean by that? Because of course, you have equality of opportunity. You know, we have hugely unequal wealth distribution, but everybody has the chance to get rich. That's equality of opportunity, right? Still, in, in, in equality of possession or outcome, that's not an equal society. Yeah. Maybe there are trade-offs between the two. So, So what is equality that each one has one box? <laughs> what is fairness? It's like the, the, the shortest one has two boxes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly the, the, the again for the recording. The example was there's a cartoon going a drawing going around showing, okay, you've got kids trying to watch a sports game through through over the fence. Um, Fairness is that each of them has one box to stand on, and so equality is each has one box to stand on. Fairness is the short one has two boxes, so they can both see. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was talking about in terms of, of merit. Yeah, the disadvantage merits special treatment according to theories of fairness. The hard bit is working out what disadvantage you compensate for. So, you know, I suppose the small kid stays small and grows up small, right? Should we say, hey, when applying to become a lawyer, they get better treatment than the tall guy? Because after all, the tall guy could see the sports when he was young and the little one couldn't. I don't think we do for that, but you know, we might for something else. If I was giving a concert, you know, I occasionally perform music stuff. You know, I'd be happy to say, short people at the front, tall people at the back. That seems fair to me, right? I'd, I'd be happy to disadvantage the tall people by putting them back or advantage them because they don't hear the music as well. So that's probably a plus if I'm playing. Difficult question, um, but I don't think they're equivalent. I think they're doing, they're doing different things. Okay, now who was... You were next, weren't you? Yeah. So we were talking about outcome of the emotional concern between the human and the AI. So... When we think about the quality of test, even the human emotions can't be uh, determined by another human, but the AI can easily determine the uh, by doing the polygraph test. So do you believe it is superseding the human emotions by the AI? Oh, that's a very interesting question. It's about um, it's it's what the social scientists and sociologists would call sentiment analysis, and then. There's been quite a lot of work in computer science about using AI to detect human emotional states. Uh, the answer is, is, I don't know yet, because the emotional states that I know have been tested for are things like happiness, sadness, yeah, content, discontent, stuff like that. That is comparatively easy to determine. Um, if I look at your face, yeah, I get quite a clue. Are you happy or not? It tends to show on your face, right? You know, it's, it's helpful. And right? what you say in your tone of voice, there are quite a lot of things we can use to detect that. Um, detecting more subtle emotions, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but yes, th these things will become possible. Right? What, what's interesting is at the moment in the state of AI knowledge, right? every AI is a specialist AI. Now, it, that's not strictly accurate. There's been some very interesting work by both Google and IBM on their, their general purpose AIs. Those AIs can retrain themselves for different purposes. Right? And I read last month that for the first time, I can't remember if it's Google or IBM, but their, yeah, their big AI, they've managed to retrain it for a new task without it forgetting the old task. That's the first time someone has trained an AI to do two different tasks without it forgetting the first one first. You know, at the moment, we have an AI which detects certain kinds of emotions. We have an AI which I don't know, determines 
uh, whether somebody should be shortlisted for a job, right? The shortlisting one can't do emotion as well. The emotion one can't do shortlisting. They, they, they're doing different things. Right? If we can start to build them all together, then the world gets more interesting, complex, scary, fun. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to say to me, are they taking over from who? Are they overtaking human capacity? Uh, I first started working on AI in 1981. So what's that? That is 41 years ago. Right. The, the idea then was to build what were called expert systems. And my idea was, OK, we can mimic the legal decision making process. We can program law into a computer program, which will tell us the legal answer in some domains. Right. And I worked on that for some years and eventually worked out why it was not going to be effective. And the answer was in almost every legal question. At some point, you came to an open textured obligation like fairness or reasonableness. And there was no way to put that in terms of rules. So I abandoned my research on making AIs and started looking at law um, and ended up here. And then now I'm looking at law, I come back to AIs from the lawmaking perspective to say, oh, open textured again. What fun, still the difficult question. Now, back in 1981, it was generally agreed that we were 20 years away from the kind of AI that would outpace humans. Today, it's generally agreed that we're 20 years away from the type of AI that would outpace humans. So we're not there yet. <laughs> We've got closer and we're still 20 years away. I honestly don't know is the answer. A very long answer to say, I have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> support from the artificial intelligence service it's about the human brain like it, it, it could be the answer i think so there, there won't be any kind of bugs or glitches for the artificial intelligence to function it's about how we are defining the system to be done so it's about a like, human call and human call right it's it's a human call to begin with in defining the system yes the problem is and this is the if you like the black box problem was then the system takes over and you don't know what direction it's gone until you find out by a wrong answer. So think back to my polar bears, right? The, 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 the grizzly bear in the snow is a polar bear because it's in the snow. The polar bear in the zoo is not a polar bear because it's not in the snow. And only when you get those wrong answers do you realize that the AI is, has not done what it's supposed to do. Because up till then, it was really good, apparently, at making the distinction. So... <laughs> And humans thought they got it right when they made that AI, but they hadn't. So, yeah, the, the thing is that the, the, we always head off into the unknown once we hand over to machine learning. But, yeah, it, ultimately it is because then, OK, the people who are running the bear recognition AI went, all right, now we know what it's done wrong. Now we can retrain it to get it right. But they still don't know what else it gets wrong. There are still unexpectedly wrong things about it that haven't been discovered yet. We had a good two chatbot start a conversation with each other in a platform without human intervention and it's, it went beyond control. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, there are lots of examples. Two AIs chatting with each other. Yeah. You've got to remember that, that we as humans looking at this stuff. We're impressed by things that we don't understand, and we're not impressed by things that we do understand. So back in 1980, uh, it was very clear that we would have reached the peak of AI development when a computer program could beat a human, grand master. Well, that happens every day now. They, 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 they're, they're barred from chess tournaments because the computers are so good. And guess what? That branch of computer science is very clearly not considered artificial intelligence anymore. Why not? Because we understand it. <laughs> right? Artificial intelligence is still doing stuff we don't really understand. Your question. A <laughs> comment. Okay. Okay. Uh, first, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting the right question. It's uh, created on the subtle and 
delicious here for me to make something to eat, to make a quality in the night, nothing but it seems easy for this uh, sandwich. So for example, we have a two two kilometers mm -hmm. chicken that are competing for the same job. One is chosen, the other one is not. When you see that that decision could be made for something that is, for example, gender. They're actually in different circles, not mm -hmm. in the same circle. So what I want to do in order to achieve some kind of equality is that the reason why I choose the one or the other one is not just, for example, that one specific characteristic that makes them different. So I have a thought that, of course, it's more of course, you may be having more explanation to that, but, but I was like really like questioning why why equality would be because it's really simple to see two people that they are in the same group mm -hmm. if they're not treated equally. It's really like superficial. Like of course you should be treated equally because you're in the same group. Mm -hmm. But if you're in this different group, what you're going to be differently treated. It's more important thing, but it's just a, a okay. The, observation. There, there was clearly a part I didn't explain very well then, because one of the points I did make um, okay. when, when I share on the slides is that e equality of treatment is also about treating different groups like, according to merit, yeah. right? <laughs> it, yeah. So, so differences between their treatment need to be justified according to merit. And so, if you had say men, women. And you go, the difference between their treatment is simply because one's so one group's women and one's women. That wouldn't be married. Yeah. Yeah. Equality yeah. Okay, I, I, that's helpful because I think that helps me explain better what I mean. I think what I'm actually looking for ultimately is that the outputs of the decision-making algorithm will be accepted as being fair. Yeah, that's in the end. That's, okay, but then I don't think... And actually that thing is going to change. I, I agree with you. Yeah. It's changing culturally and trying to do when you make a decision. Mm -hmm. But it's afterwards, not, not when you're training. And you can expect that something as actually people doesn't work for that either. Like you can expect that people make the decision. But you can you can know if the people that they are decision doing it is doing the make the decision right. You only like test it or evaluate it afterwards. I don't so think I don't think I quite got your point because that sounds like you're saying if the process is followed properly, that's good enough. No, it's, a, it's not that. It's, for example, when you see thoughts, at least in my country, mm -hmm. you actually uh, take first test is would every reasonable person would do this? This seems like really easy for artificial intelligence because you can, I don't know, you, I know this is not easy when mm -hmm. you're programming, but when it, how it's working, you, you can say that this is easy because I can track the data and know how reasonable person, majority of person should act. And the second step of the, of the evaluation is that reasonable person would do, would do the same under this specific step. Okay, I think then I need to explain machine learning better. Because 
you're right. If the AI had examples of not even every, lots of decisions that reasonable people would make enough and could from them, could pattern match those, those decisions, then that would be fine. Right? But if you say data about the decisions, right? What data are you including? Are you including the time of day? Are you including the weather? Are you including whether the decision maker was hungry or not? Bearing, it, bearing in mind there is evidence that judges give harsher sentences just before lunch than after. So hungry might be important. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm saying that maybe fairness. Actually, I don't look for such a fairness in my my law because we don't mm. have even like mm. there is no indication that law must be fair. That would be really difficult for me. Like law is uh, effectively fair. I don't know. I this oh, okay. is more difficult, but for me, it's reasonable. Uh, I mean, it's like. Trying to look fairness for, for other concepts, not, not fairness directly, but... That's interesting, because we have areas of law where we specifically ask for fairness. I know, I know. Yeah. 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 I think what the fairness thing is the reason for that. So explain, actually, you are looking for the fairness. Is it because reasonable? The only fair one? <laughs> I know. Reasonable, I understand, protected. Ah. I, I just think you can have a reasonable decision that's still unfair. Yeah. What, what you mean? There's a general test that any decision that, that's not both fair and reasonable is unlawful. That's the end of it. Sorry. Yeah. yeah wait, I think wait. I mean the critical point is it's the what is what is uh, what is fair. We have discussed like one hour and a half. Yeah. All, all the conflicts. All the conflicts that my by someone considers, for example, this is something very subjective, what is but it's fair to me, it's not always fair to you. Yeah, and it's so many things around it, like the culture, yeah, where you came from, what happened to you. So the critical point here is that all we can assess that an input to put in the AI is fair. We, so we yeah. cannot say that. Bias, so that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. That's it. Yeah, go on, go, go for it. I have a question. A good one. Yeah. I just wanted to know if we aim to achieve some fairness with AI, do you think if we get to that point, then it can help regulate and streamline uh, laws like GDPR and Mogadu, which are very complex? We can't it, it potentially could. I, I don't think it would. Um, but not, but that's because I th I think that the GDPR has developed a life of its own. It has a, an ecosystem of professionals and regulators whose existence is about the GDPR. And if you could streamline it, if you could say, actually, it's all about fair processing of data, yeah. and we now have AIs that can yeah. tell you what fair processing of data is, then all the rest of the GDPR disappears, and all the jobs of the Privacy yeah. practitioner, yeah, you. Yeah. If you might think with GDPR, it's difficult to establish what is fair. The only problem is that AI is able to achieve that, then this entire concept of GDPR is dead. I I could live with that. I've I've always had big skepticism about the G, yeah, data protection law uh, because I learned to program computers in 1975, and. The, the law, first law on, on this came is 1979, and the shape of it has been entrenched since then. Now, my university had two computers for the whole university, and it shared one with two other universities. Two for the whole university, right? I've got two on me now. Got my phone and the laptop. I've got the third one under the desk here. Right, you've all got your phones? Yeah, okay, in this room. <laughs> Benefit arbitration. So it would benefit. What's the last word? Arbitration. arbitration. That's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's going to take some time before 
there is much chance of AI replacing an arbitrator. Right? Because an arbitration decision is always based on a very large amount of information, which is specific to that dispute. Right. I think it particularly depends on facts of the case, like what, what the arbitrator is thinking. It's, it's, it's really difficult for the AI to force that. Yeah, no, I can see that. But, but for we have, for example, um, I buy quite a few things from eBay, right? E largely from overseas sellers, particularly China, little bits and pieces for making musical instruments, stuff that uniquely comes from there. Just occasionally something goes wrong with, if it's lost in delivery or wrong stuff is sent or whatever it is. eBay has a dispute resolution system that sorts that out. It's, it's a kind of arbitration system, um, but it's really simplistic. It's very, it only deals with one small aspect of the dispute. There's one remedy available. There's very little chance to, there's no hearing, there's a whole lot of stuff disappears. The more you slim down and simplify arbitration, the more AI could do for it. Right? The more general it is, the less AI can do because it's more complex. Right? So yeah, I mean, Elias there is doing his PhD on uh, what well, digitization in the kind of shipping Chain the, the value chain, the electronic bills of lading, all that stuff, all the way digitization, a whole lot. Okay, now that will simplify arbitration because a lot of the evidence is no longer disputable. So that will make a huge difference to arbitration. You won't have people sitting there saying this quality certificate was forged or obtained in a way that was improper or whatever. It will be a blockchain-based quality certificate with an official issue and no argument right so that, that'll help a lot right? so there'll be better data coming out there'll be a lot more objective data coming out of the work of people like him are doing right? but it still depends on the issues right if the issues are immensely complex as they usually are in say shipping arbitrations you know it, the problem didn't occur because the ship was late the problem occurred because the ship was late because 12 other things happened because 12 other things and that's what the arbitrator, there are 16 parties and they're all having a big fight about who pays out to everybody. Right? AI is, is too simplistic for that. But slim it right down. And yes, you know, yeah. yeah. And then of course, don't forget some arbitrations, like if you're talking about foreign direct investment arbitration, okay, really that's political decisions being made. Yeah, so we, you know, AI, no chance yet. All right, guys, look, I think we're going to have to, to call it to an end. Thank you very much for coming. Great questions and comments. Really helpful. Thank you.